talk about the mainframe area era. Uh, the mainframe era uh, in computing occurred from 1950 to 1970. It was a time when IBM really dominated the industry in the United States and in Europe. And uh, mainframes are basically like the image you see right here. They are large rooms filled with banks of uh, data reels, magnetic tape, processors, input panels, so forth and so on. And usually somewhere in the middle of the room, there's the one output uh, device, like a printer, basically, that prints out the results of whatever it is um, you're, you're storing. Um, the mainframe era lasted for about 20 years. Like I said, IBM dominated it. Uh, by the 1960s, these mainframes were using transistors, and the transistors really were a big improvement because they used significantly less power. Uh, they also used 8-track tapes, too, on these mainframes, too, to store data and to transmit data. 8-track uh, tech was almost like inputting a program. Uh, almost like a, a game or something like that, a, a program into it. Um, the data for these mainframes was still stored on magnetic tape, and punch cards were actually still used to program the machines a lot of times. Um, most companies still had a programmer in their company, and that programmer's job was to create punch cards. And sometimes those punch cards, they, you know, depending on the size of company, you, know, you created thousands of them a day, basically. And usually in the mainframe, there was kind of like one person who had access to it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there's usually one person who really maintains the mainframe. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about batch computing. Um, most of these mainframes, at least early on, were operated off a system of management known as batch computing. And uh, batch computing was basically you had one person in your office um, who mostly um, dealt with the mainframe. The mainframe tended to be located in a separated, isolated room. had to be a very t climate controlled room because the mainframes produced a great deal of heat. Plus they had very specific energy requirements too. So, um, you know, they had to be, the room had to be set up especially for it. Plus too, the, these things weigh so much by the time you put all this computer equipment in one room, they also had to have special floors to actually be able to support uh, the weight of these things, so fire protection, all that kind of stuff. Um, but typically how batch computing worked, you had a person in your office who needed a problem solved. Okay, um, The person who needed the problem solved nor the programmer actually had direct access to the computer. In fact, the people who programmed the computers on the, the little punch cards most of the time didn't even enter the punch cards into the computer at all. Um, usually their office was in a different room or different location. Um, you know, these batch computers, like I said, were set up in specialized air-conditioned rooms with limited employee access. Employees rarely ever went into the room. In fact, it was usually carted off. You had to have a special key to get in, and frequently you just kind of communicated, um, you know, in and out through a mail slot pretty much. Um, usually, you know, only one or two computer operators had access to it. Basically, how batch computing worked, you know, the results, um, person with, um, who needed the needed a problem solved, would basically put in a request to the batch computer operator to run this problem through the batch computer and they'd send it off. Um, basically the computer operator would input the program and put the, uh, input the problem in minutes or hours, whatever it was, the problem would be solved. Um, the, the person operating would then print out the results and then basically stick the results in an envelope in an inner office mail and send back out to the user, whoever that you know, whoever requested the information. The user never actually pulled the information directly themselves. You had to do it through that. Um, so you know, it's a very, it's not a personal computer kind of environment at all. Um, you know, you work in an office that has a mainframe computer, but you actually don't have access to the terminals the way you access this information at all. Um, also, too, uh, the, these mainframes would frequently dump their memory out on paper, do a memory dump. Basically, every so often, as kind of a backup, they print out the memory. And uh, these things right here, that's something that would take place over a whole weekend of printing out memory, um, so forth and so on. Um, so that's, a, that's one way, batch computing. Eventually, batch computing, though, proved to be very inefficient and very unpopular. Um, it's very cost efficient too. You know, the fewer people in your office that operate the machinery, usually the more expensive it is to actually hire those individuals, and the more expensive it is to kind of maintain the machines at times. Plus, too, if you're if you're waiting for a series of calculations to be performed by one person, 
Um, you know, you could put in your request one day at 9 o'clock in the morning and be lucky if you get your results back the next day by 9 o'clock. So you have a whole day of kind of waiting for results. So the system that replaced batch computing is timeshare computing. Timeshare computing kind of solves some of the problems. And it's basically some of the same ways we have today. If you work in an environment where your office shares a common server, work in an office where your um, office, maybe you all share a common hard drive now. Uh, you know, computers have become so advanced that one hard drive can run multiple monitors and multiple input uh, devices and so forth. Um, in this photograph right here, this guy I want to point out to you, though, on his right-hand side, that machine you see next to it, that's where the punch cards are inserted. That's a punch card reader, basically, that reads the punch card code, interprets it to the computer so the programs can run, just so you get a sense of how those punch cards, they would be stacked up, oftentimes stacks that have a thousand cards in them to run an equation or run a certain problem, whatever it may be. Um, time sharing started to develop mainly in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Basically what you'd have in time sharing is workers would have multiple terminals in their work where they could provide direct access to the reports. Um, you know, the terminals here, they, they can direct access. If you notice there, if you look at his his terminal there, there's no monitor there. I mean, um, there's no monitor that he's really reading the results out from. And the only results he's actually physically seeing are the results that are printed out on the paper. There's no monitor yet, but there were monitors in many of these uh, time sharing devices. You know, one one workstation might have two or three monitors. Basically, in the, this system right here, two or three people could input problems at the same time, and the computer's internal, basically the hard drive of this time share or the hard drive of this mainframe, could operate fast enough to solve those problems simultaneously. And um, that's just true of any computer. I mean. The, the computer itself, the processor that processes this works much faster uh, than the actual input and programming of it. So what it does is it allows multiple problems to be solved at the same time and spit back out as results much faster than additional problems can be fed into the computer. So it's always kind of one step ahead. And because of that, it's really able to kind of keep up with whatever use is being um, you know used for. So... Um, by the 1970s, the mainframes really kind of came to an end. Um, the main reason for that is because there was expectations for computers that could be programmed to do infinite tasks. Um, you know, in, in mainframes, basically, for each type of problem you're trying to solve, you really had to individually program it for that. And so you're constantly reprogramming computers, largely because their internal memory did not store a lot of those programs. The program was actually on a card. It wasn't in the actual computer itself in many cases. Um, so, you know, the computers we have today, we don't have to, every now and then we have to add new software to do something, but by and large, basic day-to-day -day operations, we're not constantly adding software, adding programs to our computers. Um, also, too, one of the reasons mainframe can is because programmers could develop software using an interface accessible to larger groups of users that could in turn manipulate hardware easier. Basically, what happens is software starts to develop at a much rapid rapid pace, much quicker pace, and starts to outpace hardware. You know, it doesn't make sense to constantly update the hardware. What makes sense is to constantly update the software, improve the software. Um, and what happens is, basically, um, during this period, you have a lot of software developers. This is when, like, Bill Gates and Paul Allen and those folks really get heavily involved in it. But you get a lot of software developers who come along and they're building these, um, you know, programs. They're inputting in. Well, they want direct access to these machines. They want direct. Uh, they're they're used to a much more interactive experience with the machines, and that kind of spreads throughout the office. Whereas everyone now wants an interactive experience. You know, under the time sharing method, basically you had to set an appointment to use the computer. You know, people shared the computer throughout the office. If you have 600 people in your workforce and you have four computer terminals, you know, you might wait a week to get access to the computer or something like that. And and so that, that had to be changed. And one of the reasons it had to be changed because programmers really could access things much faster than before. Um, also, you had um, inter individual users can interact with the computer at a larger number of workspaces. Um, you know, people started demanding to have computers at their individual workspaces. It just made it more time efficient made people much more productive and made certain tools available to everyone in your office rather than having to centralize everything in one giant room 
one giant although servers are still most uh most companies still have some kind of server room that's kind of special but you know the the mainframes kind of go away another reason the mainframes go away is they're so expensive i mean a mainframe system can cost in the hundreds of thousands even millions of dollars uh, to install when i went to aflac and i asked them about their mainframe system that they had installed back in the 60s they said at the time that mainframe unit cost them one and a half million dollars that's an amazing you know investment you know at that time and still today would be an amazing investment um, but you know the equivalent today is if you buy one and a half million dollars worth of storage and servers and so forth that's a lot i mean you can start like a new company with that kind of uh, amount of material um, but back then, that was just what they needed to kind of get up and running. So from timeshare computing, um, oh, yes, yeah, there's a slide. Why did the mainframe era end? But, you know, that's, that kind of went over that as far as why it actually ended. Another reason it ended, too, the outputs for mainframes were really kind of clunky. I mean, uh, you know, actually getting the reports out and getting it in some kind of, usually what happened is the report would be printed out, and then the user would have to interpret that report and redo the report so that, other people in the office could actually read the results. Uh, so it's almost like a decoding operation that took place there. Basically, the end of the mainframes led to the development of the rise of personal computing. That's kind of the era that we're still in today, although we're getting into the era of cloud computing, which is a little different than personal computing, but again, we'll cover that some more as we go through this semester. Um, the rise of personal computing is driven by that stored program principle. You know, data plus programming in the same location equals greater accessibility, greater storage, greater usability. You know, more ability for individual users to program and customize a computer to their um, needs. One of the first computers that starts to be developed in this mindset was called the Whirlwind. The Whirlwind was developed in the early 1950s. It was a joint project between MIT and the United States Air Force. A lot of these early computers were some kind of military involvement in it. Um, basically, in this, the user inputted commands into the computer and executed them. Um, that, that Basically, the, the user put in input, basically code, that caused the computer to execute, to actually run the program, to run the operation that the user wanted inside the computer in the in the mainframe of the computer it would interpret that information and then basically reinterpret it and spit it back out as data to the user in a language they can actually understand it's basically the equivalent of putting something into a computer in english you know basically you can understand english and read english the computer reinterprets that english to computer program language uses that computer program language to very quickly do its uh, tasks of calculation gets it results, spits it back out to you as English once again, and does that all in milliseconds. I mean, the processing is really uh, speeding up uh, during this time. Um, that's basically the forerunner of the modern PC. A great example of that is just a Microsoft document. You know, my, I told you all Microsoft Word is just an HTML document. Um, you don't see the HTML code because what they do is they hide that from you. They create a very friendly user interface over the top of it that, allows you to just read basically like a book, you know, basic, plain, left-to-right English as you read along. But beneath that is code that as you type in from the keyboard, your, you know, research paper or whatever, it is basically transforming that into code without you even being aware of it. And that code is really what's saving it, what's really creating all the spacing, all of that kind of stuff, all those commands that are already there. A lot of that started with the whirlwind. The whirlwind was a big kind of development there. Um, also, what you see in the 1950s is the development of the first programming languages. Uh, the first real programming language was Fortran. That was written in 1957. And off to the right there, I have an example of Fortran. If you look at Fortran, there's some things, there's some structural uh, qualities to it that are very similar to HTML and CSS and so forth. Basically, uh, Fortran was a coded language that used symbols and various rules to program computer operations. It's a coded language that used symbols and rules to program computer operations. It's really the forerunner of HTML, CSS, Java, all these different programs. Very quickly, there's going to be more and more programming languages developed. We're really fortunate now that we've kind of reached a point that some of the languages at least have been somewhat standardized. Um, we're not trying to invent the next HTML, and we're just trying to improve HTML. HTML now has HTML5, which is another version of it that you really kind of have to start to learn to really um, keep up with the web as it is. But uh, Fortran certainly lasted for a while. There was another one called COBOL. 
uh, C-O-B-O-L, that business is used. That was a very specific business programming language for accounting uh, software and so forth and so on. So what you see with these is the rise of personal computers because the more code that the user has access to, the more programs the user can build and customize their computers. And what happens is, uh, especially when you start seeing the early development of the Internet, you start seeing people like Bill Gates, Paul Allen, um, early Steve Jobs and so forth, um, sitting there writing code for hours on day end. Uh, you watch documentaries about Gates and Allen, and you know they would go several days just in rooms writing code endlessly, and then crash and sleep for a day, you know, eat, and then go back to writing code again because they had to build the structure of all this. Well, there are hundreds of people like them doing these sorts of things at the same time. And basically what they're doing is they're building the foundation of the modern-day operating systems, the modern-day Internet protocols, the modern-day programs that basically run all these computers that make our lives easier on a day-to-day -day basis. All of that had to be built from scratch. It had to be built from code. And fortunately, as computers started to spread and personal computers started to be spread, the number of people who could participate in that um, development expanded almost infinitely, pretty much. I mean, every major tech school in the country, uh, MIT, Harvard, Georgia Tech, Cal, um, you know, Cal and also all their schools basically developed very, um, usually now all their schools had some kind of software engineers, computer scientists developing new programs all the time. So it kind of, kind of went, uh, programming kind of went viral, really, uh, especially by the early 70s. And that leads us to the program data processor. Um, the program data processor is a very important computer in American history. And again, uh, it's a little misleading. The, the name of it doesn't actually contain the word computer. It's program data processor. And the reason it doesn't contain the word computer is because at the time when this was created in 1957, the company that created it did not want to compete directly with IBM. IBM was like kind of the bully on the block. IBM almost had a basic monopoly over the computing industry. And uh, to call your device, your machine, a computer was to go headlong right against the biggest producer in the land, which was IBM. So instead, the company that produced this, the Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, that was the acronym they were commonly called, DEC. There was DEC and IBM, or the big computer manufacturers in the late 50s and 60s. You have DEC, and in 1957, they decided to name their program Data Processor, you know, a PDP, basically what it is. But the PDP is significant. Um, you know, in the history of computers for several reasons. Number one, uh, the PDP developed alternatives from large mainframe computers that relied upon batch community computing and uh, shared uh, computing, basically. Um, it really started to give, the, the, the PDP is the first time you start seeing individual computers at people's desks. Basically, you know, the desktop computer. These are still fairly large devices, though. I mean, they're bigger than today's modern desktops. But again, the computer is becoming much more of an individual, much more of a personal device. Um, you also see a clear transition in computing to interactive operation, where the user is putting in commands, and the computer is interpreting those commands live, pretty much. And you're not having to build programs constantly through batch um, punch cards. You're not having to go through your local programmer in your office to get things done. You can actually interact directly with the computer and get the results that you want. You also see a greater degree of artificial intelligence among computers. Again, as the programs themselves start to be stored in transistors and the data is starting to be stored there, there's less and less input in terms of programming each and every time that you want to put in uh, some kind of uh, uh, problem you know, to the computer. And so the computer is thinking ahead, and the computers begin to think out things that you never have to think about. You know, basically, you don't have to program every single move to it. The codes and the programs become much more sophisticated to anticipate what you need so that you make one single command, and that command in anticipation does a thousand tasks, basically. And that's what happens now. If you were to click on Internet Explorer or Mozilla Firefox and open it up, that act of double-clicking it and watching that program pop up, that's a thousand different decisions the computer has made. You've made one that you wanted to open it. 
and that's artificial intelligence and that really starts to be created uh, during this time uh, during uh, during the PDP another big thing about the PDP is Bill Gates and Paul Allen used the PDP series computer to develop the first um, software for their personal computers and for personal computers in general uh, Microsoft and Apple both were basically built on PDP computers um, Another big advantage of the PDP is you did not have to have climate-controlled spaces for the PDP. Uh, the PDP, PDP starts having internal fans. Um, the machines don't, you know, the transistors are getting smaller and smaller. The amount of heat produced by these devices and electricity used by them is getting smaller and smaller. And because of that, you no longer need these bunker-type rooms to store these. And plus, the devices are getting smaller, more lightweight, which means you can store them almost anywhere in your buildings. You know, previously on the mainframe, you couldn't put a mainframe on the third floor of some of your older buildings. Just the weight, some of these mainframes weighed several tons. You know, these personal computers now are getting to this point that people can either lift them or use like a dolly or something like that to lift the thing. You know, it's, it's It can be moved by one person now. Um, that's different. Um, the PDP also creates a new business model for computer development companies. You know, companies that are going to make money building computers for people. And that business model is basically the business model for IBM that made them so successful for a long time was IBM created customized programs for individual customers. Individual customers came to IBM, and they still do, come to IBM with problems. They identify what they need in their businesses, the kind of software they need, and IBM basically builds a mainframe or a computing system that helps solve those issues for them. Okay, that's it. And that's, that's a very costly uh, way of doing things. IBM can charge an arm and a leg for that service because they are the experts in it, and they're going to build you a custom one. Now, in some ways, it's very good because if your business is fairly fixed, it's not changing all the time, if you have the same constant needs in your business, you buy an IBM mainframe, and it may last for years and years and years. And it did in the case of, um, case of IBM and, uh, you know, at Aflac. So, um, you know, with Aflac, Aflac bought their IBM mainframe back in the 70s, and they were still using it for 30 years, basically. Why? Because it fit their need. Their business model didn't change a whole lot in that 30-year time. Well, that was the existing model. Well, the debt company really invented a new model, and that model is you develop machines that customers could customize for themselves, that customers could customize for themselves. Basically, you open up the guts of a computer, and you allow your customers to develop programs that can then run and be read and interpreted by your computer. And that's where we are on modern day computers. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's lots of software that we buy and we custom install into our computers that customize it. But at the end of the day, anyone with a little bit of computing knowledge can alter their machines a great deal to meet their specific needs. And the PDP was a big need. I mean, that, that is the basis of personal computing. Personal computing is you want a computer that you can customize for your own needs. You know, that's general enough that will meet the basic needs of what you have. But beyond the basic needs, there are things you want it to do. Well, now, because of the uh, PDP, you can do that. So PDP really is a critical, critical step towards personal computing. I mean, you, don't, you won't get the Apple, you know, the Apple computers without uh, the PDP. Another important thing about the DEC was the DEC also dominated the early ARPANET. ARPANET is kind of the first early internet that's used, and that first internet, those different input devices that they used, the, the, the devices that communicated from one to the other, they were PDPs. And the reason they were PDPs is because PDPs were highly programmable, and um, they could be programmed to communicate with one another. Um, that's, that's the key reason. So, you know, the PDPs play a huge role. Um, in the early history of computing and kind of get us to where we are today. All right, um, for last week, um, I signed a reading by Vannevar Bush entitled As We May Think. Um, I think, you know, the Vannevar Bush article is very significant. Um, I'd like us to discuss that a little bit online. Uh, when you go on Design to Learn, um, you know, after you've listened to this lecture and so forth, um, I do want you to kind of discuss the Vannevar Bush article a little bit. I have some questions on there y'all can kind of think about it a little bit. But this article, As We May Think, was written in 1945 and published in The Atlantic. And it's largely considered the most important document in terms of technology uh, related document of the 20th century. You know, Bush in this article really lays out the foundation, the goals of, uh, you know, technological development in America for the next 50 years or so. 
it's amazing as you read this article closely, um, you really kind of see how many future innovations uh, Bush was able to kind of foresee, you know, foresee the development of. And also some of the things we've been talking about so far are definitely mentioned in the Bush article. Um, he mentions tubes. Uh, and actually, right off the bat, in like the second, yeah, the second um, page of this, he, he mentions thermionic tubes down towards the bottom. That's vacuum tubes, basically. He mentions the uh, forebears of all these developments as well. So anyway, so be sure you've actually looked at that. I mean, that will definitely appear on your midterm uh, in some form or fashion. And uh, like I said, we'll discuss that here. So um, now that you've listened to this, what I want you to do is go to Design to Learn. I posted a link on there for a podcast about the life of Alan Turing. It's a very short one. It's only a few minutes. Um, but I think it provides some really good insight into one of uh, the world's kind of first you know fathers of a computer or whatever it may be but first important computer developers so i do want you to listen to that there's some questions on design to learn for you to interact with and you know talk about um issues related to turing and there's several other questions on there as well about the history of computing in general that i want you to kind of review um you know if you have time if you're really interested in all this stuff there's plenty of uh youtube videos on there about you can almost youtube uh, put in there and search almost any of the devices i just mentioned and you can actually find videos that'll show you how they really function how they work and tell you kind of a short uh, history behind them um, there's also several great websites. There's a museum of, of computing, basically, that has a really wonderful website that has a lot of really high-resolution co color images of a lot of the different uh, computers and some of the different people that I've mentioned in this presentation. So I basically wanted to get us up to the point of the start of Apple and Microsoft. And a lot of times people think Apple and Microsoft pretty much invented the computer, the current computing world that we have. And that's, that's really not true. There's a lot of forebears to them, and a lot of people who also significantly contributed so all right so that'd be it uh, do remember as you listen to this that next week's class um, will also be held online um, next week when we meet um, we'll, we'll um, discuss more specifically about the history of the internet itself and I have several uh, I'm gonna have an assignment that I want you to do basically what I've done for this is done a screen capture video to, to do this lecture and I want you to practice doing a basic screen capture uh, video in order to do that you'll need some screen capture software I can show you some places to get um, if you have a new Mac or a new Windows computer I mean a lot of those computers come with screen capture software if you don't have it there's several free ones on the internet that can kind of direct you towards uh, what I've used for this is snag it you can actually get a one month free uh, subscription to snag it and to kind of preview it and if anything that's all you really need for this assignment is that one month preview um, Another thing you're going to need if you don't have one is a microphone, a USB mic for your computer so that you can actually talk and record um, your presentation. But I'll give you more details about that presentation uh, very shortly uh, so you'll kind of know what to do for the next week as well. But I really want you to practice, uh, you know, using these basic tools, communicating, you know, um, you know, knowledge through it and sharing it with one another in the class. So. Um, ultimately, what you'll do is the same thing I do is post this on YouTube and share it with the class. So uh, we'll, we'll send more instructions about that later. All right. I hope all of you all have a very lovely evening. On uh, Thursday night, I'll be around a little bit. So um, later in the evening, about 9 o'clock or so, I'll definitely be online, and I'll do my best to interact with those of you who have posted on your discussions. Basically, for the discussions, you have from Thursday through next Tuesday or so to kind of really participate in that. So be sure you do that. and and take this assignment really seriously to do a good job on the discussions uh, don't just regurgitate everything people have said a lot of times it's a lot better to read the discussion questions and then just jump in and write your responses before you go through and read everyone else's because that'll certainly by the time you read five or six other responses that certainly influences your own ideas and kind of clouds your own thinking so all right well i'll see all y'all next uh, week or so but um y'all have a good evening